Good morning, everybody. Welcome back to the channel. It's time to get between the headlines. Now, there's lots to cover today, lots to catch up on. And so we're going to break these stories down one by one and see what the future has in, in store for us. Now, we're going to be talking about the possibility that the vaccine mandate may be ended for the military. Weird times, you guys. We're also going to talk about how doctors have been censored and how that has come up in the debate. What doctors can and can't say about the scientific consensus. All that's coming back up again. This is good news because if we're having this conversation, that means that there's a lot of doctors who are unhappy about how they've been muzzled and their hands have been tied when it comes to their patient care. The very fact that people are talking about this is a good thing now never forget that all of this is bipartisan it started under Obama and it actually probably started before him when paper charts were digitized papers your doctor's records under Obama were digitized into electronic medical records and I'm going to break this down a little bit in more detail so you guys can truly understand how this very important step in the way that your patient charts are handled by your doctor was the segue into our current reality in which the government now has access to your medical records Here's the problem. With the paper charts, it was much more difficult for the government to get their hands on your medical records. Why? Well, what doctor do you know would submit your paper charts? Let's say they got a subpoena or something to the government. Most of your doctors would not do that, would they? They would be like, well, why do you want to see my patient's private data? There would have to be a really good reason as to why a doctor would give up your private medical information, right? Well, as soon as all that got converted over to digital and electronic medical records, the government can just dip in and dip out. And they are doing it. All you got to do is do a Google search. Federal and state governments may have a right to your medical records. In addition to medical payment, other agencies may have access to your records as well. For example, law enforcement, child protective services may be able to see your records if a subpoena is obtained. So, they've taken the doctor out of the middle of stopping the government from accessing your medical records. There are also other reasons why they access your medical records, and you can do your own research on this part of it. But essentially what they what they can do is use the data as long as they redact your private name from the data to run studies and simulations and to look at trends and these things. And the way they get away with not needing a subpoena is they say, oh, we've, what do they call it? We've depersonalized the data. This is what they call it, depersonalized. Let's look that up. Depersonalized data. Now, the reason why I know a little bit about this is because, as you know, I used to work in the medical industry and I was around. This is when I was at the height of my career and this all this was going on. So they depersonalized the data and now they can use the data. OK, because they say, oh, it's not attached to any one person. Massachusetts Group Insurance Commission thought it could make depersonalized medical records public to assist in research and information. So this is a very real thing. I don't know about you, but this gives me a very unsettling feeling. I don't want the government poking in around people's medical data, my own personal medical data, for whatever reason. That's why I don't really go to doctors ever. I haven't been to a dentist in, gosh, 15, almost 20 years still have no cavities huh what once people start poking and digging around your mouth uh i think that's when people probably get more cavities i i can't even remember the last uh cleaning that i've had 
and no cavities all these years. I'm almost 50 years old. Now, I'm not bragging. I'm just telling you that, you know, sometimes we should be going on faith with some of this stuff. The more people dig around and poke around in your body, it, what if that's opening things up to other things? I don't know. So, under Obamacare, the paper charts were digitized into electronic medical records. The federal government now has access to those records for whatever reason. They could say it's Homeland Security. And the Privacy Act, the HIPAA Privacy Act, didn't really protect you from the government. In fact, it was the opposite. It protected other people that you know from finding out about you being sick or your personal medical state. But think about how harmful that is as well. Shouldn't neighbors be comparing notes as to, wow, my neighbor just died of something. Wow, everyone in the neighborhood's dying of something. Well, you would never, ever know that. You would never know the root cause of that because of HIPAA laws. You're not allowed to know, and the doctor's not allowed to go publicly and say, look, a bunch of my patients are falling out because that would violate their HIPAA laws. You see how the government, everything is backwards, backwards world, and it covers everything up. You know, I've always had a problem with, you know, even way back when I was younger, no one ever could tell me what really happened to Uncle Joe or so-and-so. I have an uncle. I still don't know exactly what happened to him. Oh, my mom just says, he got sick. Well, what happened to him? How did he get sick? Uh, his liver. Okay, what exactly happened? Why? Why did that happen? No one ever knows. And that's how things happen in plain sight. This is how genocides happen in plain sight. Because no one's comparing notes. So, Obama opened the door for your government to know your personal medical data. But before that, it was the Patriot Act. Homeland Security. It was Bush. This is bipartisan. Losing your privacy under a privacy act. Now, all of this has real world consequences when the mass vaccination campaign began. Remember? Because the government could now see exactly who is and who isn't vaccinated. In fact, watch this. Uh, electronic, let's see if it comes up. Medical records. Uh, vac uh, let's see if it comes up here. Here you go. Using... Met electronic medical records to improve, what does it say, tracking patients in need of the smack scenes. They tell you right here, oh, this was 2010, already they were talking about it. You get digital proof of your smack scene record, locating and tracking. See, all of this came about because of electronic medical records. So wait, why, why did this just so happen to happen just a few years before all this went down? It seems to me that it was all pre-planned, step-by-step, president-to-president. I hope you guys are seeing this now. I hope you understand. So when you hear me picking on the current lead candidate for the presidency, which is Trump, understand that I'm not picking on him. This has been a long chain, both sides working together to create our current reality in which they are steering the ship. Let's take a look at this first story. Let me make sure you guys are with me. We're going to take a look at this first story going on here. All right. Is spreading medical misinfo a doctor's free speech right? So they're talking about this debate now. The New York Times. When government nuisance signed into a law bill that would punish California doctors for spreading false information about Vidco-19, smack the nations and treatments, he pledged that it would apply only in the most egregious instances of misleading patients. Okay, who gets to decide what's egregious and what's not? 
it may never have the chance. Even before the law, the nation's first of its kind takes effect January 1st, faces two legal challenges seeking to declare it an unconstitutional infringement of free speech. Plaintiffs include doctors who have spoken out against government and expert recommendations during the spam endemic, as well as legal organizations from both sides of the political spectrum. Our system opts to reward or opts toward, I'm sorry, a presumption that speech is protected, said this one lawyer, which submitted the friend of the court brief in favor of one of the challenges. That suit and another filed this month in California have been become an extension of the broader cultural battle over the spam demic, which continues to divide Americans along stark partisan lines. It's simple. My body, my choice. It's pretty simple. There shouldn't be a stark divide. They could also more broadly test what steps, if any, the government can take to combat the scourge of misinfo and disinfo. Okay? The law narrowly written in hopes of avoiding narrowly written in hopes of avoiding First Amendment entanglements would designate the spread of false and misleading info to patients as unprofessional conduct, subject to punishment by the agency that regulates the profession. Ah this could re result in fines, suspension, or revocation of doctor's license to practice in the state. California Medical Association, which represents Nearly 50,000 physicians in the state sponsored the legislation, but the doctors involved in the two lawsuits argue that the law's provisions remain both vague and excessively intrusive. Huh. Now, so this is what's going on. I'm not going to read this whole article, of course. Look at this long article. But look at all the comments. This person says, enough. Who gets to decide what information is good? Okay. Okay. I'm not going to read the rest of that comment because they'll say, oh, that's a misinfo. But look, people are starting to wake up. And they're talking about kind of the shifting or uh, developing, let's call it consensus, scientific consensus that maybe some doctors were right about in the beginning. That, and then they were told it was misinfo and later they found out it wasn't. So people want this to stop. Now, let's go on to the next story here and shift gears a bit and talk about the world and how it's been shifting into the metaverse. You guys were fast approaching the digital world and things are not letting up. Video game addiction is up and I think we all know at least one person who spends at least half their waking hours or more in the digital universe. I spend a lot of time online fighting the enemy, of course, but many others spend a lot of time in the digital universe, the fictional universe, gaming and such. And like all other constructs, the gaming universe has its Pied Pipers as well. Uh, young people making millions of dollars on Twitch and YouTube. How? Well, they're gaming 24-7. Now, the question is, are these Pied Pipers fueling the gaming uh, craze, I guess you can call it? And I don't think they are necessarily. I think that these Pied Pipers are put in place to legitimize gaming as a viable source of income and a career. Because without stories like this, it would be really hard to rationalize the benefits of all the countless hours that people are spending in the gaming universe but they people rationalize and they say hey if you can make money doing it then people look the other way don't they now what's in question is at what human cost what is the human cost to spending 95 percent of your waking hours in this universe right that is the question and here's another question. How many people are actually making money in gaming? Now, my son's a gamer, and he's actually ranked pretty high, close to the top in the League of Legends world. Uh, but he has yet to find a way to monetize his abilities to make an income. So gaming is likely 
the 1% making 99% of the money. That's what I've seen so far. And the 1% is kind of the carrot dangling for the rest to keep them engaged to legitimize this industry. Let's read this. How a blue-haired former fast food worker makes $1 million per month. This is unbelievable. He was ready to collect $1 million for a day's work all without leaving his house. And while the work entailed split-second decision-making and laser-like focus for 10 hours, the day ahead had nothing to do with high-frequency trading, cryptocurrencies, or market activity of any kind. Instead, the player, Ninja, known in real life as Tyler Blevins, was playing the video game Apex Legends, created by Respawn Entertainment, before an audience of 12 million followers. You guys, this is where everyone's watching live streams at. It's gaming. This is our new world. And, you know, I could decode video games probably all day long. And talk about how people are being programmed by the video games. But I'm not sure what good that would do. This is absolutely an addiction. It is the shape of our world to come. As we all will be tossed into a virtual reality. Before we know it, everything will be seen through the lens of some kind of video game entertainment. Everything will become a video game from ordering a pizza to going on to Amazon or whatever. It's all going to turn into one big video game. That's what I see coming into the future. Very few people will leave their houses. And any exercise you get will probably be through the virtual reality and this is what it seems is going on. It'll be like the Ready Player One universe. So, they've made a couple of heroes, haven't they? Like this guy Blevins. And here he is gaming away. And they like to make their heroes to keep everyone on the program, don't they? Now, here's some of the statistics of the new gaming universe. Many people still associate video games with adolescents, but the average age of U.S. gamers is 34 years old. Over a quarter are older than 45. In another stereotype-defying statistic, 46% of U.S. gamers are female. You guys, it's almost half and half. Now, my son said that uh, a lot of the female gamers are on their phone apps, not in the... Uh, more developed online gaming universe. That's what my son said. Anyway. I don't know if that's true, but that's what he told me. In addition to the surprising diversity in the global gaming population, there's the sheer breadth to consider. 3.24 billion people around the world play video games. The biggest market in Asia with 1.48 billion gamers. Now, if you didn't hear uh, this, China um, is limiting uh, youth to a few hours a week to play video games. Now, I don't know how he's enforcing this, but that is the new law in China because they see this as a problem. Probably not, not a lot of stuff's getting done. More and more people be pull, being pulled out of the workforce. And in terms of world economies, this is where you got to ask yourself, what is the future of our world? Wow. Now, check in with you guys. Get into our next story. Now, this next story is important because years ago, I told you guys that very soon, gay couples would be suing churches for not marrying them. Remember that? And I, we were thinking and talking about this and thinking, I wonder if this is going to be the abomination that causes desolation. The bad thing in the holy place. Well, there's a lot of other things going on with our mainstream churches that I'm not very happy about. But what if this is the thing that pushes everything over the edge in terms of God and what he will allow and not allow in a place that claims to worship him? Well... The debate is now front and center with the Supreme Court as some state laws require that 
gay that gay couples are allowed all of the same services that non-gay couples are allowed under anti-discrimination laws. Now, this is a Reuters article. U.S. Supreme Court leans toward web designer with anti-gay marriage stance. So, the state in question here is Colorado. And they have a law on the books that says you have to serve all people regardless of their sexual orientation. Otherwise, it's discrimination. Now, in this case, you, the Supreme Court ruled against this and allowed this particular woman who was a web designer, that was the service that she was providing, who she didn't feel right morally to serve same-sex marriage couples for their web design and give her services because she's an evangelical Christian web designer. But you see the metaphors here. This is metaphor for a church, isn't it? An evangelical Christian web designer. All you got to do is take it a step further and go, okay, the next step is, would you marry a gay couple in a Christian church? Can they force you to do that? Under anti-discrimination laws. So, in this case, a Colorado web designer was not allowed to refuse service to an LGBT couple because of their orientation. But she fought it at the Supreme Court and she won. But here's the question. What happens when future Supreme Courts tilt left again? Because we know they are. We know it will at some point. Will those courts force churches to marry gay couples? That it will be the question. Let's read this. U.S. Supreme Court's conservative majority signaled sympathy on Monday toward an evangelical Christian web designer whose business refuses to provide services for same-sex marriages in a major case pitting LGBT rights against a claim that freedom of speech exempts artists from anti-discrimination laws. Justices heard more than two hours of spirited arguments in Denver area business owner Lori Smith's appeal seeking an exemption from Colorado law that bars discrimination based on sexual orientation and other factors. Lower courts ruled in favor of Colorado. Smith, who runs a web design business called 303 Creative, contends that Colorado's Anti-Discrimination Act violates the right of artists, including, including web designers, to free speech under the Constitution's First Amendment by forcing them to express messages through their work that they oppose. Smith, 38, has said she believes marriage should be limited to opposite sex couples, a view shared by many conservative Christians. She preemptively sued Colorado's Civil Rights Commission and other state officials in 2016 because she feared she would be punished for refusing to serve gay weddings. See? See where all this is headed, you guys? So, welcome to the Matrix. Now, let's get into some of these other stories today. Welcome to Magic Land, where flu disappears for three years, and then voila! Just like that, it comes roaring back. And I got sick, a lot of people got sick, and it's weird because everybody got sick at the exact same time. It None of it made any sense in terms of interactions we've had with people. It just, everybody got sick at the same time. How does that happen? When there's no contact, uh, I guess you're going to have to figure that out. Washington Post, flu hospitalization soar as triple viral threat looms ahead of the holidays. Nearly every U.S. state is battling high levels of flu-like illness. Public health authorities warn Monday as multiple respiratory viruses threaten to overwhelm the health care system. While people travel for the holidays and gather indoors with friends and family. Center for... Um, okay, so here's what's going on. Weird, right? Very weird. Now, let's get into Trump a little bit today. Because... According to the powers that be, the New York jury found Trump.org guilty on 17 counts of tax fraud. Of course it's 17, right? Which is Q. Everybody's talking about Trump's guilty verdict on tax fraud. Now, 
If this happened to any other person, they would go to jail, wouldn't they? Heck, they put people in jail for not filing your taxes. Tax evasion. Fine up to $100,000 sent to jail for five years. Don't, don't file a tax return. You go to jail. So, until someone goes to jail, I'm not going to believe any of this stuff. To me, it's smoke and mirrors. It's, to, it's sympathy for the devil. It's to make you feel sorry for people. Okay? The day that Trump goes to jail, I will take back everything I said about him. If he's in, and I'm not talking just for a few months. I'm talking for his crimes that they say he did. That they got everybody hyped up over and divided over. Why would, why would he be such a bad person if they hate him so much, Casey? It's all smoke and mirrors. He'll never go to jail because any other person would go to jail, but he's not going to go to jail. Just like none of the people in the Black Book went to jail. An egg stains Black Book. Nobody ever goes to jail. Very few people go to jail. So, here are the penalties for what they say Trump did. Okay? And also, looks like in 2020, about 600 people were sentenced for tax crimes in the U.S. Al Capone, as everybody knows, got 11 years in prison for tax evasion. These are the penalties, you guys. So, if this is so serious, is the way the media makes it sound, oh, he should be in jail for life, right? But he won't. So, smoke and mirrors until somebody goes to jail. Now, here's the problem with our tax system. Our tax system favors the rich in more ways than them just never going to jail for this stuff. They use a loophole to use charities to not pay their taxes. Here's a Bloomberg article. Now, this has a paywall behind it, so I'm not going to be able to click on this, but the wealthy use loophole to reap tax breaks and delay giving away money. Foundations shift billions to donor-advised funds, skirting U.S. laws requiring transfers to the needy. A Bloomberg analysis finds. And there's this article by Vox. Charitable deduction is mostly for the rich, a new study argues. That's by design. Let's read this one, because this will help you get a snapshot into why you should never, ever, ever pat a rich person on the back for the giving to cancer or giving to children's charity. Because to them, the mushier the better. Because it makes them look good, but really, they're just... Tax dodging is what they're doing. Let's read this. In the early 20th century, legislators carved out a tax break to help mega philanthropists. It still shapes our tax law today. In the United States, if you donate money to charity, you can deduct it on your taxes. That is, you don't have to pay taxes on the share of your income that you donated, unless you're poor. The way the charitable tax deduction is set up, lower income Americans can't really take advantage of it unless you earn a lot of money. It makes no financial sense to do your taxes in a way that lets you claim the charitable deduction. 2017 Republican tax bill made even fewer Americans eligible for the charitable deduction by hiking the standard deduction. Critics responded that they'd make the tax deduction a deduction just for the rich. But a new paper published this week argues that throughout the 100-year history, the charitable deduction was always aimed primarily at benefiting the rich. The paper, Founders, Fortunes, and Philanthropy, A History of the U.S. Charitable Contribution Deduction, um, takes a comprehensive look at the policy history of the charitable deduction since it was introduced in 1917. Huh, that was a year before... The first flu outbreak, wasn't it? Let's look at the conclusion of this. The contribution deduction was created to protect voluntary giving to public goods by rich industrialists who had made their fortunes in business. Thinkers of the time believed it was better for services like libraries, universities, and aid to widows and orphans to be provided by the rich out of generosity than by the state of than by the state out of necessity. So they set up the tax code to enable that. 
it might seem like there's not much to learn from tax code history that's a century old but how we en enact the charitable deduction matters and so does how we think about it the world of nonprofits and philanthropy has changed dramatically since the early 20th century when charities really were funded near exclusively by the ultra rich our attitudes about charity have changed too very few people today think it's morally better for hospitals and libraries to be provided through largesse from billionaires than through public funding when philanthropy got started in america there was no federal income tax andrew carnegie and john rockefeller both founded their famous philanthropic organizations before the 16th amendment which made it legal for the federal government to assess an income tax came into law when it did lawmakers saw philanthropists as a source of social capital that would be protected from the new tax on high incomes lest the government find itself having to pay for programs philanthropy had previously funded voluntarily out of the donor's own pockets so you see what happens here i mean that was a word sandwich, so let me give you the synopsis there. The government, instead of having to pay out of their tax dollars for some of this stuff, just allowed the rich to do it and then made them pay no taxes on the money. That's what they basically said there. Because governments are greedy, and they'd rather just use your tax dollars for other stuff. Thus, the deduction for charitable donations designed specifically to make sure rich people would get do would keep donating to their foundations even after the enactment of the income tax. So, what else does it say here? Let's fast forward because they're in World War II still here. The pr okay, so at the same time, the percentage of income that people were allowed to deduct went up. In, 20, in 1917, it had been 15%. In 1952, it was increased to 20%. And in 1954, it was increased to 30% for some charities. Normal people do not donate 30% of their income to charity. In general, people donating that much money are independently wealthy and have a wealth that far exceeds their annual income. So the primary group affected by these changes was wealthy people. At the same time, a different set of changes to the tax code effectively took the income tax deduction away from ordinary Americans. In 1943, the year before these changes to the tax code were introduced, 75% of households were eligible to take the charitable contribution deduction. In 1944, almost all of those households were better off taking the newly introduced standard deduction. So, the tax deduction for charitable giving got better for rich people while becoming increasingly inapplicable to everyone else. These big ta uh, big shifts to the tax code have been reinforced recently with the 2017 Republican tax bill. So, so society, do we mean to be a society that is subsidized that subsidizes giving by the rich while taxing giving by everyone else? The report convincingly argues that when the deduction was introduced, yes, that's exactly what we meant to do. It is less clear that most Americans or even most policymakers endorse those side effects of our tax code today. Now, what they don't tell you here is that when the rich people give this money, they're not really giving the money, okay? They're giving it, but they're really not. They're getting it back somehow. And there's a big secret in the room here. They're not giving this because they really want to give charity. Who gives away 30% of their income just to give it away? So, that is the skinny on that. Now, let's get into this next story. Now, this is strange. Here's a Fox News article. Shut them down. More Chinese secret police stations reportedly found, prompting call for consulate closures. Now, look at this picture here. This doesn't even look real. Let's zoom in on this. It almost, look, they've got the backdrop. What is this, New York? I mean, is this real? What is this, a tarmac? It says photo illustration. So they tell you right here this is a photo illustration. 
look they got this guy and you can see his eyeball poking out through the black hood I mean what is going on here this whole Chinese police station story look at all these guys back here what so I think all of this is conditioning is what this is to put the idea in your head the Chinese police stations are now a thing and they shouldn't be a thing this is some kind of glitch in the matrix that this can happen in plain sight and nobody really cares countries should shut down police consulates until the communist regime closes its network of illegal policing operations this is happening in America you guys a former deputy national security advisor said after nearly 50 additional stations were reportedly found they found 50 police Chinese police stations in America Wow China's overseas police stations are one of several ways Beijing is eroding our national sovereignty and depriving ethnic Chinese in particular of their rights as citizens of democracies what else does it say here so they're saying this is about processing Asian Americans and enforcing Chinese laws on those Americans here in the in the United States I don't buy that cover story Safeguard Defenders, a pan-Asian human rights organization, published an investigation on Monday called Patrol and Persuade, reporting that another 48 Chinese police stations were operating abroad in addition to 54 the group had identified in September. Okay, so the report did locations span 53 countries, so they're not just in America, the, the entire 50. There's two in New York City. One in Los Angeles and one in by and one set up by the Nantong Public Security Bureau in an undisclosed location. So we know the Communist Party of China has been ramping up its transnational repression efforts around the world over the past years. Now, don't you think that the FBI would be more focused on something like this? Uh rather than oh, you and me saying something wrong or incorrect on YouTube, <laughs> right? I mean, we're American citizens. These are foreign nationals in our country, you know, enforcing laws. I mean, talk about sedition. You want to talk about sedition? This is way more critical than anything that happened before this by any American citizen, okay? So... We'll continue to follow this story. Now, uh, I got a couple more stories for you guys as we begin to end the show. I want to make sure you guys are with me. Welcome to the show, everybody. Good morning. Let's get into this weird structure that was found on a Florida beach. Now, I don't know what this is. There's probably some logical explanation for it. CBS News. Mysterious structure discovered on a Florida beach. Beachgoers in Florida discovered a mysterious object buried underneath the sand. It almost looks like a runway. Let's look at some pictures of this. Now, this thing started protruding out of the sand after some beach erosion from Hurricane Ian and Nicole. This is Volusia County. Now, if any of you live near this beach, you can get some better pictures of this stuff. Or I know some of you like to go in the sand and look for objects. If you're anywhere near this beach, uh, you know, take some pictures of this or video and send it to me. Email it to me, CaseyBrown1973 at gmail.com. It appears to be a wooden structure and looks like pieces of wood poking out of the beach for 80 feet. Discovered Thanksgiving weekend by beachgoers. He said an archaeologist is visiting the beach on Tuesday to examine the structure. I wonder if they have this blocked off. Look at this wooden structure, you guys. Gosh, it almost looks like a giant backbone right here. Huh. 
boats, maybe? But look how perfectly parallel it is. I don't know what this is, you guys. Volusia Beach is where this is. The erosion of the beach has been unprecedented. We haven't seen this kind of erosion in a very long time. 25 years. Here's an aerial view of this structure. Parallel lines, they look like they're offset a bit. What could this be? Is it some kind of a, an old dock? I guess we'll find out in the coming weeks and days. Now, here's our last story. And this is a shocker to me. This is an AP article. Vaccine mandate for troops. They're actually going to remove it. Now, here's what upsets me about this. Uh, it's a little late. After countless troops were fired for not complying, lost, I mean, some of them lost their pensions, were punished, lost their benefits, and now all of a sudden they're going to rescind the mandate? Basically admitting that they stole our rights or stole the rights of the armed forces personnel who are supposedly standing up for the very freedoms that they were forced to give up? I mean, the hypocrisy here is glaring. Now, the question is, why? Why are they now talking about rescinding this mandate? And my guess is it's because now they need to refill the roles, don't they? So they can do some more sacrifice down the, down the line. Now, I always thought to myself that the vaccine hardball move was to basically turn over the aging military. They needed new fresh blood. What better way to do that than to give an ultimatum, which would cause people to have to make a very tough decision and quit the military or be forced out. So I don't think these people are up to any good. If I was you in the military, I would, I would not see this as some kind of olive branch. Let's read this. The smack scene mandate for members of the U.S. military would be rescinded under the annual defense bill heading for a vote this week in Congress, ending a directive that helped ensure the vast majority of the troops were smack -sinated, but also raised concerns that it harmed recruitment and retention. Republicans, emboldened by their new House majority that next year, pushed the effort, which was confirmed Tuesday night when the bill was unveiled. So, here we go, you guys. Talking about rescinding the, ma the mandate under the new um, act. New military act. What do they call this thing? Yeah. So, let me go back in the chat here. Those are the headlines for today. Now, tomorrow, I have a special show for you guys. I finally finished watching 1899, the TV series, Netflix TV series, by the makers of the dark TV series from Netflix. And what you're going to see is jaw dropping tomorrow. I've got all the clips put together. I've got to edit. I'll probably be editing most of the day. Putting together show notes for tomorrow's show. Because 1899 is all about ships. Ships that are metaphors for people. We are the ships. They talk about portals opening and closing. Literally everything we've been talking about. Whirlpool portals. Ships falling into whirlpools and coming out the other side. Pyramids. Nested realities. All of that is included in tomorrow's show. So I watched the entire season. There's 10 episodes. Took me several days. Collected all the screenshots. So we will do a presentation on that tomorrow. And then after that, at some point, I want to get back into finishing up the Manifest TV series. And in a few days after that, I'm also hoping that they release the copyright claim on Black Adam that we did. And that will hopefully publish in the next five or six days. So you guys can finish watching that. So, let's see here. Let's go down to the chat. We can do a little Q&A for a bit. 
as we start to finish up the show. We are the ships lost at sea, absolutely. Talk about all that tomorrow, you guys. Yeah, hit the thumbs up if you haven't already. Okay. Yes, the waters represent baptism. But the waters can also be dark, too. You can have dark baptisms. The black water, dark water. All right. Okay. Gotta love those algorithms. Have us stuck at 666 people watching. The picture is so doctored. Isaac must be talking about the picture of the Chinese uh, police force walking people out onto the tarmac. Yes, lots of black goo symbolism in. 1899. There's one part where a woman actually gets injected in the finger with this black goo. And it's in the right hand. And her right hand and right side of her body turns black. So she receives the mark essentially. All right. What else is going on, you guys? Thanks, Nick. God bless you, too. Yes, the ships equal the rib cage. We are the ships. Uh, yeah, it started with her right hand turned black, Scotty, and then, uh, her whole right side of her body, because she was marked with the black goo of the ship. The blue blood. And they ask her what's wrong with her, and she's like, I'm a little seasick. Well, the sea is the blue blood. That's where all the blue blood creatures come from. Copper-based organisms. So. Yes, your body is your vessel, your temple, Tina. Absolutely. Thanks, Christina. Oh, wow. Someone's neighbor turn, arm turned dark, dark purple. After something interesting. All right, you guys. Well, I'm going to go ahead and let you guys go. Hope you have a great rest of your day. And I'm going to get started working on tomorrow's show. Much love, everybody. Take care and be safe.